Good evening. Today is Wednesday, the 14th of July, 2021. And this evening, I'm joined by my co-host, Simon, and we're going to be discussing the planned withdrawal of all U.S. and NATO troops from Afghanistan by September the 11th of this year. That will be, Simon, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And the question that we want to ask um, this evening that we would ask for your interaction on is should the U.S. and NATO withdraw their forces from Afghanistan? And we're going to be unpacking some of what's gone on in the past 20 years, looking at some areas of strategy. Simon's done a great interview for us uh, as per usual, and um, hopefully we will um, have some time that is very helpful. Nice to see you, Simon. Good to see you as well. You covered from, uh, from Sunday night? Well, just, yeah, just, just about. I, I had selected Italy before it all happened, um, but I, I was gutted. I, it really was. Anyway. Yeah, another, no, 55 years of hurt, and we have to wait another... Next year. At least year. we only have to wait another year. Next year. the World Cup. In 2022, Qatar, but, uh, England are the winners. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's draw a line under that, because yeah. too much hurt, too much back engaging involved exactly. in that. But, uh, you know, the, the team did extremely well to get to the final, and, and they played like Lions. Yes. Um, so, yeah, and got that... Had that first goal, uh, got a second... Different story, but... Hey, ho, uh, on, on to other things. I, fr I frightened <laughs> Randall when I shouted out and cheered. Um, he, he started weeping, uh, but <laughs> he'll learn to cheer. Yeah, so just to remind you, we are live and we are interactive, so love to know your views and your text message tonight. And yes, we are back in the studio. Um, Reagan, what was so mm. interesting, I think, about Afghanistan um, and this whole whole issue of this US-NATO withdrawal is the way that the withdrawal is actually happening. The, the fact is that uh, Biden has set a date, mm -hmm. strangely enough, September the 11th, uh, 2021 of this year, which will mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So effectively, he is sending a message to Islamists uh, and terrorists around the world that this is an American defeat at the hands of the Taliban. Uh, which can only accelerate uh, Islamic terrorism. We saw that President Obama did this in 2011 in Iraq. He pulled US forces out of Iraq. And what happened? We got ISIS. Uh, and so there is a great danger that, again, Afghanistan will be used as a safe haven uh, by the likes of Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, or even a worse Islamist group to emerge and use Afghanistan as a, as, a, as a staging post to launch attacks against the West. So it's not so much the question we've never, should never really been in there in the first place, just should have just taken out Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and mm. then got out rather than trying to, to actually build a nation, trying to, to build a state, trying to implement democracy. Mm. Uh, I think that's where it's all gone wrong. And of course, you can't actually govern Afghanistan because it has something like 35 different languages and 50 different tribes and warlords. Yeah. It's impossible. It's not a country. Uh, it's set by different tribes. And of course, the tele and they, these tribes are only united against adversaries. When they're not fighting off the Soviets or the Americans or the mm. Brits, or, or, or the Persians, then what they're doing effectively is fighting amongst themselves. Yeah. So uh, it's so easy to view these conflicts in the Middle East through Western eyes. And that's understandable. It's our context. But we have to try to look into the scenarios uh, themselves and realize that the Middle East is very different culturally. It's very different in uh, regard to its, its function uh, from... It, every form of governance all the way down to um, the family. It's all to do with ideological um, issues. So we see in Afghanistan, even, um, even though there are um, some core principles that the Islamists will agree on, there are the other personal and tribal conflicts that have really nothing to do with Islam, that have um, probably predated Islam. Uh, if we look at also the difficult terrain, uh, it's nothing that our troops um, from either Britain or the United States, it's nothing that most uh, within the NATO 
Lakeland contingent uh, would have been used to or experienced in and certainly dealing with and bringing alongside and um, making deals with some of the tribal warlords um, in, in regard to um, trying to oppose Al-Qaeda and trying to unearth where Osama bin Laden was. He, he was hiding for 10 years um, successfully um, before, before he was um, caught and, and killed. Um, if, if you look at the complication that was had in bringing all of that together, I don't think we should be too surprised that we're having this conversation. I wish we weren't having this conversation. I wish things, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I wish that we could have learned lessons from history so we didn't repeat the mistakes of history. Um, but here we are. No, absolutely. Uh, and why it's so important, I think, is because strategically where Afghanistan is actually situated. So mm. it's, uh, it, it's, it's in Central Asia. It's then very close to India, Pakistan area. For, so uh, that's Central South Asia. It's very close then also then to the Middle East and also to yeah. Europe and also, you know, it's very close to China and Russia. So its strategic importance is immense. Very uh, that's why so, historically so many armies have wanted to take control of Afghanistan to actually control almost the whole region, uh, uh, which is vast. But if we have a, just go down some of the facts, since uh, British and American and NATO-led uh, forces have been in Afghanistan since 9-11, I think it was around October 2001, uh, the S Bush... 7th Bush. of October, Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, that was as a result of uh, talks with the Taliban, who were the de facto rulers of Afghanistan really since the 90s. Um, the request was made, hand over Osama bin Laden, and they refused to do it unless there was um, concrete evidence that he was involved in the 9-11 attacks, um, and they wanted to haggle and the U.S. At, at that point and historically has always been, we don't negotiate with terrorists. And, and the Taliban, um, Al-Qaeda, uh, they're, they're recognized as extreme Islamist groups. Um, the, the Taliban is more localized in its endeavors um, and, and yet was harboring, quite gladly, uh, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Of course, because that's where Al-Qaeda was birthed from. Yeah. Because they were Mujahideen, and the Mujahideen joined the Afghan fighters to overthrow the uh, Soviet invasion right. of uh, Afghanistan in 1979. Um, and then we saw that the, the Russians left in, in uh, I think, 1989, which led to the, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a great danger here that we could see history repeating itself and we could see the collapse or the decline of the United States as a world superpower because certainly everything that uh, President Biden is touching in terms of foreign policy is falling apart. And, and this is no different. I think this is a situation that could escalate and get worse. So during those 20 years, we've had some uh, 456 British soldiers um, who were killed in Afghanistan, some 2,420 Americans, along with hundreds of other coalition troops that died uh, during this 20-year conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, we also see that civilian casualties have been estimated to be around 50,000 people. Uh, as you said, this was codenamed Operation Enduring Freedom, but um, I think the strategic objectives changed. Mm. Uh, the firstly, going into uh, Afghanistan was to um, assassinate and kill uh, bin Laden and al-Qaeda and to make sure that Af Afghanistan was not a safe haven for terrorists to actually launch. And then, of course, they, uh, the Americans got involved with the Northern Alliance, paid them millions and millions mm. of pounds to, to fight against the Taliban. And then the objectives were to, to destroy the Taliban and make Afghan a kind of a, a modern kind of state with modern infrastructures and build a state. And that's where I think everything started to go wrong. But um, yeah, it's uh, extremely, extremely dangerous situation. Decent film on the uh, getting the Northern Alliance on board called 12 Strong um, sort of details that for any um, war film buffs that are out there. Uh, it's it's good. I, 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 I do recommend it. 12 Strong. It's fairly um, new, just a few years ago. 
Um, one, one of the th things you're right uh, about the strategic objective, Simon, the Taliban were hit very hard, very quickly, pushed back. Um, their, their power collapsed by December. And so uh, um, from December of 2001, up to about 2003, uh, there was this uh, full-on endeavor. Was, the UN got involved, um, setting up various um, teams and, and groups and objectives that would establish a de democratic state, essentially, um, in Afghanistan. And we, we see, um, for, for many years, Hamid Karzai was the um, leader of that. One of the problems, um, though, again, ideologically, if you are trying to transplant democracy, uh, which is a very Western value and very much um, a part of how we do things, into that type environment, you're already starting off on a wrong foot you're already, um, in all likelihood, engaging in a failed operation. If you have over 50 different tribal warlords who are um, we're not fighting and, and linking up um, with one another, either against the Taliban or um, you know, the, the Soviets going back in, um, in the day, and, um, or, or the US in, in some ways um, before alliances formed, you, then you kind of have this situation like, right? what is your democracy? Yeah, but, but let's, un let's understand, because I think there's a misconception about what democracy is, mm. uh, and particularly the Bush administration tried to impose that on the Middle East. And this yeah. is a concept that if you allow people to vote, then they'll choose a particular party and they'll have legitimacy. Um, but that, in a sense, is only one aspect of democracy, right. because you need to build the pillars of democracy. What are they? freedom of speech, uh, freedom of press, a free judiciary, uh, freedom of assembly, a freedom of religion. Mm. These are institutions of democracy that you need in order to, it to function well. And they're all fundamentally against Islamic ideology. Yeah, but I, I think maybe they didn't calculate the fact that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and others throughout the Middle East would actually use democracy in order to get to meet their objectives. We saw that in Egypt yeah, after the fall of uh, Mubarak. They had uh, elections and then suddenly Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. So potentially it can be very dangerous, but it, it takes a long time to build these, these institutions. Uh, we got uh, 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 an email in and this is from Jill. She writes, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Yes, I do believe the US and NATO should withdraw their forces from Afghanistan. Too many lives have been lost and it has not changed anything. Uh, one thing I feel strongly about is that they should resettle the Afghan interpreters uh, who helped in the conflict uh, somewhere safe. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, but they are going to leave them in Afghanistan. And of course, we know what's going to happen when the Taliban is already controlling almost, uh, is it two thirds? Yeah, they, they uh, are right. expanding. Even as I was on the way, Simon, I saw a, a news article that indicates they've taken another um, a Afghan military outpost on the Pakistan border. So they're making uh, massive inroads. They're already taking control of roads, blocking supply lines to major cities. Uh, they're very much uh, about to regain all of the power that they lost, something that they've been working on since 2003. Um, with their in insurgency um, against yeah. allied troops. Supported by the Iranians and others as well. So this one is another one. This is from Joyce who writes, I fear what will happen to girls and women. Mm -hmm. What about their freedom and education? Well, it, exactly. We're going to talk about that later. What life will be like for those living under the Taliban will be absolutely horrific. But before we um, um, go to some news items, I think it's important to have a look and learn some of the historic less, historical lessons that we can learn from previous invasions of Afghanistan. So we've seen the, Mes the Macedonians, uh, I think under, that was under Alexander the Great, the Greeks as well, uh, the Mongols, the White Hun, the Persians, the Russians, the Soviets, and the British armies have all been defeated in the mountains of Afghanistan. So also in uh, 1930 and 1839, the uh, British Empire invaded Afghanistan uh, to impose civilization on the factious Afghans and to install a puppet leader to give the British Empire dominance in Central and uh, Southern Asia, of course. 
India being the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Uh, British forces comprised of 58,000 people, uh, 30,000 camels and a pack of foxhounds, uh, fierce Afghan resistance and a series of disastrous strategic military decisions after three years forced the British into a humiliating withdrawal from Kabul. Some 700 European soldiers, 3,800 Indian sepoys and 14,000 civilian staff were massacred on the icy mountain passes. And uh, the British Empire was defeated in 1842 in Afghanistan, uh, was considered the worst single disaster to fall upon the British Empire since the collapse of Singapore to the Japanese. So there is something to learn in terms of history when it comes to Afghanistan. That it's a nation you don't want to mess with. Mm, absolutely. And the chilling words of a uh, local Afghan chief um, as the British invaded Afghanistan, you've brought an army into the country, but how do you propose to take it out again? Um, that was in the 19th century when the British Empire invaded. I, I think, Incredible. Simon, we just don't study history. Um, a comment that I've made um, just on a very local scale, there's a shop near me that um, has had a constant change of hands um, as a cafe, a coffee shop, a small little restaurant, and it's constantly changed hands. And I've asked the question, why do people not ask for the history of that building? Like, what's gone before, what didn't work? In a much grander scale, like, surely our military chiefs, surely our heads of state should be doing the hard work of looking at, um, but before rushing in, how do we work out a strategy where we can accomplish objectives of justice, I mean, there had to be some uh, recompense for 9-11. There had to be a statement made um, after the taking of um, so many lives on U.S. soil. Well, we uh, went, they targeted the wrong country. Yeah, well, uh, Iran, right, I mean, the Iran, Iran regime has is the for, head of the state. For, for years we've been playing games with Iran and not really... Yeah. And, and, yeah, and Iran the is the one that's been supplying weapons to the Taliban yeah. to fight against British and American troops. They're the ones that supplied the IEDs. Um, they're the ones that are mentioned in the 9-11 uh, Commission report mm. uh, of being conduits with Al-Qaeda yeah. in operation. And I think something of the scale of 9-11 couldn't be done without state-sponsored intelligence what and support. What we're dealing with are um, products of the root, right? We, we're actually not at all dealing with the root, probably because for years we've been too afraid to deal with the route, if we're honest. Um, I mean, that's what it looks yeah. like. But I, th I think if we, if we take ourselves back to the 90s, to the kind of Clinton administration, I mean, after the end of the Cold War, the United States felt like they, they, they were the world, uh, they were the only world superpower. They yeah. effectively won. They defeated the Soviet Union. Uh, they emerged on top. Um, and therefore, what we saw then was, was the Clinton administration just didn't invest in human intelligence. Um, the intelligence security services in the United States were not cooperating with each other. So there wasn't any great cooperation. There wasn't any looking at new emerging threats. Mm. I mean, Clinton had bin Laden and the entire Al-Qaeda leadership within his sights just needed to press a cruise missile after the attack in, in Kenya and Tanzania back in 1998. So he's missed so many opportunities, which then got worse and worse that led up to 9-11. Um, and of course then, with, a, with the, the, the attack that we saw on 9-11, uh, America had to respond. But, but did they do it too quickly? Did they not think out some of the strategic objectives? Um, you know, the question is, you know, was the idea to build a, a state planning part of this process? But, you know, America was, was and is still the world superpower. Uh, in the world, so it's yeah. a real shock. I mean, let, let me um, just speak um, from my perspective as a US citizen and passport holder. I'm British as well now, um, thankfully, but um, there's a great degree of hubris in how the US has functioned when it comes to um, quite a few different conflicts in the past century. Um, reluctant to involve ourselves um, with, with um, Britain in World War One, reluctant in World War Two, we were kind of in the end strong arms into it um, th through what happened at, at Pearl Harbor. 
Um, and the, then, you know, we, we have a few conflicts afterward, which arguably didn't go to plan. They didn't go well. Um, the conflict in Korea, uh, you could say that was, well, North Korea and South Korea remained disti were, were distinct, which we're thankful for because South Korea um, has r remained a, a very good stronghold of democracy in, um, in that region. And there are quite a few Christians um, in South Korea who are faithfully sending missionaries out around the world. They're lovely. Uh, but then, then you have Vietnam, which was a total failure. If, if we look, uh, a great uncle of mine, after my son is named, was killed in Vietnam. Uh, the troops were sent without a clue as to how to deal with the terrain they were in. They had no understanding of jungle warfare. Um, the psychological element um, of the Viet Cong's attacks, um, it, it was on a different scale. So then eventually you have, after years and years of that war piddling along, this de decision, well, we'll start handing it over to the South Vietnamese. Well, we'll, we'll start handing it over to um, our, our allies here, and, and they'll be responsible for making sure everything is preserved and kept. In reality, it was saying, we can't win this war. The Viet Cong is winning. We'll never get out of this. We're going to leave those who uh, have allied with us to die. Um, so th the U.S runs from Saigon, and what happens? Well, the, the whole country is um, taken over, the Viet Cong um, are the victors. But the US, in, um, in some people's mindset, oh, they didn't actually, or technically, lose the war because they, they actually withdrew and handed it over to the, um, the, the local authorities. They it got overrun then by the Viet Cong, and the Viet Cong took the whole of loss. Vietnam. It's a loss. It's a loss. It's a similar situation because yeah. it, uh, it was JFK that started to send uh, US troops into, into Vietnam to support the, uh, uh, is it DM? the uh, yeah. leader in South Vietnam uh, against um, the uh, communist forces in the north, the, the Viet Cong, uh, Ho Chi Minh, who was pushing his forces. Uh, and uh, of course, then you're sending more troops in, more troops in, the South uh, Vietnamese army didn't want to fight. So relying more and more on American forces and then just got worse as a part of the domino effect. So again, I think we could face another very similar situation very in Afghanistan. That's what's happening by there, instead of withdrawing strategically mm. and bombing and attacking uh, um, Taliban targets uh, and, and to, uh, to actually then send a very strong message that America will be back and America will protect his interests and will protect the friends of the United States and NATO, particularly those in Afghanistan. Um, uh, now with this withdrawal saying by the 11th of September, we're going to move our entire forces out. Uh, uh, and then leaving the, uh, leaving the, for example, the Afghan army to the mercy mm. of, the, um, of the Taliban. Um, and they just, they're not up for it. They don't have that support. So we could essentially see a massive great, uh, you know, we're going to see bloodbath. a bloodbath on our hands. Um, uh, and that is directly responsible for the, for the US president. But I George think... George W. Bush spoke um, last week, uh, this past week, um, to a German station saying, uh, that it, it's leaving them up to slaughter. And I, I think there's a degree of truth to that. But, uh, you know, wh but why America are we not can't stay there any longer. 20 years. Yeah, exactly. Coalition forces have why, been there. Why are, we not, why are we not following your plan of bombing the Taliban? Well, because last year, uh, in February of 2020, and what personally I think was a her horrendous move that's completely outside of the normal policy of not negotiating with terrorists. Um, the Trump administration made a deal with the Taliban um, that it would not interfere with the Taliban, it would not attack the Taliban if the Taliban did not attack and interfere with its forces. Um, but there was no promise, there was no deal made that they would um, um, keep from attacking Afghan forces. Absolutely. Got a few more emails. Uh, this is from uh, Satinda, who writes, uh, uh, greetings to you both. No doubt with the absence of coalition troops in Afghanistan, the Taliban will make a swift return to power, uh, which we can see is already underway. In line with this, there will probably be a return to the terror attacks of the past, 
However, with the advance of technology, drone attack seems to be the way forward, which have been used by countries like Iran, Turkey and Yemen. Uh, due to this, maybe the age of the suicide bomber is coming to an end. Mm. Uh, and then you say, moreover, uh, God help us if the Taliban get their hands on some. Uh, moreover, this will no doubt embolden terrorist groups like the likes in Syria and Iraq. Already the rocket attacks on US bases have increased, which has led to some very recent US strikes, all of which doesn't appear to have been reported. Uh, that's a brilliant email, so thank you very much for this one. This one says, hi, Simon Reagan. I watched a program about the troops leaving. I know some of those who aided the US are worried uh, that their families will be targeted. Uh, the women under this regime will suffer again. It's far from an ideal situation. But you give scripture, Anita and Mary, so I appreciate this one. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim uh, the year of the Lord's favour. So thank you very much for that one. And let's have a look now at this uh, excellent uh, CBN report that looks at this awful withdrawal by uh, the US and NATO forces out of Afghanistan, leading those uh, supporters and friends, including Christians, at the mercy of the Taliban. Here are elite US trained Afghan government forces surrendering and shaking hands with Taliban commanders. And here are U.S. Humvees now at the service of rebel forces. The U.S. military's top commander in Afghanistan, General Austin Miller, says he's worried about the rapid loss of districts to the Taliban. The loss of terrain and the, and the rapidity of that loss of terrain has, has to be concerning. We're starting to create conditions here that won't look good for Afghanistan in the future if there's a push for a military takeover. This map shows that most of Afghanistan, the areas shaded red and black, are already under Taliban control or are being contested. As the Taliban advance across Afghanistan, the announced withdrawal of U.S. forces has only emboldened them. The White House has set September 11th as the deadline for a full troop withdrawal, which began under Donald Trump. But retired four-star General Jack Keane says the Biden administration's assurances of support to the Afghan government remind him of similar assurances given by President Obama when the U.S. withdrew from Iraq. And what followed was a nightmare for the region. These are the similar statements that were made by the Obama administration in 2011 as our troops were withdrawing, and we know what happened as a result of that. We got ISIS. The war in Afghanistan began 20 years ago after 9-11. The cost of the war is a staggering two and a quarter trillion dollars. One expert called it the largest failed global redistribution project in history. Almost 2,500 American military servicemen and women have died. But you'll hear no gratitude from former Afghan President Hamid Karzai, who says the U.S. has failed and should just go. They're living behind a country in conflict, with so much loss of life, with so much suffering. Panic in Kabul is building as the Taliban march toward the capital. Those who can choose to go abroad have left. It will long be debated whether America should have ever gotten itself involved on the ground in Afghanistan. But America's departure is certain to bring more suffering and death to this troubled nation. Dale Hurd, CBN News. So there's just a little bit there um, for our viewers. You can clearly see that uh, this is, is putting the whole of Afghanistan at risk uh, once more at the hands of an Islamist, essentially terror organization. Um, Simon, I think one of the things that we have to consider very much is, okay, withdrawing 20 years, it's, it's time, but could we have done this in a better way and what will be the cost afterwards and um, that's what we're going to be well i think i think the big cost of, of this one is the this is going to damage america's credibility and standing on the world um effectively or create a political vacuum the likes of russia and uh, china want to fill particularly the chinese 
uh, will want to gain favour with the uh, with the, with the Taliban and and use that as strategic point to project Chinese power. Um, I think the other the message as well that this gives a kind of green light to Islamist terrorists around the world by saying, look, America's been defeated by the Taliban. Therefore, you know, let's uh, let's attack the United States. Let's attack the West because it's very weak. Um, and there's no show of strength. I mean, nothing nothing works when you just have a very quick rushed withdrawal. We saw that in Iraq in 2011. We're seeing that now. Uh, and what will result in a massive great bloodbath. Um, th this is part of the problem as well. Here, you know, we have the Afghan military losing all over the place. And we, we have here our, our very own Minister of Defense, Ben Wallace. We, we've just seen clips of the Taliban and, and their, their fighting and what they're doing. Um, he says that they're part of the solution at the moment. Uh, an organization that lops off people's hands, crushes homosexuals under walls and throws them off of towers and tells girls that over the age of 10, you can't actually yeah. study anything. It's, These a guys are it's a criminal offense for girls to study yeah. over the age of eight. The, 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 um, this, they're the solution. And putting women in burqas as well. Yeah. You know, not the hijab, but actually the burqa. Dehumanizing. Like, uh, complete control. Um, and also then the retribution against those who stood with the American coalition forces as well. So that's going to be a bloodbath. Yeah. Uh, and also the Christians that sadly get caught up in this. Uh, we've got a few more emails. Uh, this is from Glenda who writes, uh, it's awful uh, that the women and girls will be treated worse than before. Uh, women were beheaded going back to the dark ages. Not sure if there will ever be an answer to this situation. So sad. And that's from Glenda. Uh, we got this one says, I think the question should be, what are the globalists up to behind the scenes? Uh, lives mean, leaving, sorry, lives meaning nothing to them. Uh, once again, America's equipment left to terrorists. God bless you. Exactly. And this is what we're concerned about. Um, and there's another one, but it's a bit long, so read that one out. It says, Dear Simon and Reagan, we all know how vastly expensive war is. And I think this has cost the Americans in the, the region of two trillion. trillion. US dollars. Uh, extraordinary. Uh, I have one simple question. Who is funding the Taliban? Uh, shalom and blessings. Ivan, that's a good question. I think uh, the Iranians are behind that. Maybe even the Qataris as well. Mm. Uh, anyone who's effectively don't want to see Westerners succeed in the Middle East. But to give a greater insight into, uh, into Afghanistan and the Middle East, I, I recorded an interview yesterday with uh, Dr. Harold Rode, who was an advisor to uh, US Secretaries of Defense in the Pentagon for over three decades, uh, including uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was U US Secretary of State when America launched uh, its response to 9-11. This is an interview that I did with him earlier. Uh, great that you can join us uh, from your home in, in Florida, and it's a great pleasure to be doing this short Zoom interview with you. I'm always happy to oblige, Simon. You're a great man. Thank you. Um, how, uh, we just uh, hear the news that uh, your president, uh, President uh, Biden, has announced he's going to pull all the remaining U.S. forces in Afghanistan out on the 11th of September uh, 2021, which marks of 20 years of military operations in Afghanistan. Um, in your opinion, is this a smart move or is, is this going to be a very costly decision made by the U.S. president? Well, I actually have two answers. They may sound that they're opposed to each other, but they're really not. In the situation that we are in right now, America is fleeing Afghanistan. It is abandoning those who have been helpful to us during the 20 years that we've been there, translators, suppliers, whatever it is. And in the Middle East, they wait, people wait until their enemies are weakened. The enemies of the Taliban and others are those who help the United States. And since we are abandoning them and not taking them with us to the United States, very few, that is understood as a time that those who helped us will pay and they will pay largely with their lives. Now. On the other hand, if we look at a general context here, 
the great Professor Bernard Lewis used to say, when you have a problem in the Middle East, you go in, you take care of the problem, you do whatever is necessary, and you get out as quickly as possible. Because if you don't, you will be drawn in and uh, they will wear you down. And in the end, uh, they will win. That's how, that's what has happened here. I would have argued and I argued way back when in um, uh, after September 11th, I think it was 2001, if I'm correct. Um, you go in, you take care of the problem and get out. I, we can just prove this by all sorts of things that have happened throughout history. You notice the Israelis went into southern Lebanon. They stayed too long. Um, the result was they did exactly what the Americans did. They fled southern Lebanon. And, what, um, and they didn't take care of so many of the people who had worked with them. They took care of some, but there are a lot they abandoned. And those that had worked with the Israelis, who the Israelis did not take care of, uh, shall we say, didn't suffer a kind fate. Because in the Middle East, there is no real concept of, um, of, of uh, uh, that you're supposed to, not pity, you're supposed to um, um, have compassion. That's the right word on others. The word compassion, really, Middle Easterners are not compassion. And they go after their enemies with a vengeance. And that's what happened. Now, so, Harold, um, can I can I ask you? You were advising um, Donald Rumsfeld, um, U.S. Secretary of State, uh, who was actually in charge of uh, America's military mission to um, to hunt down the leader of Al Qaeda, Osmar bin Laden, um, to destroy the Al Qaeda terror network in Afghanistan, and to remove uh, the Taliban. Um, was that an was that the right military decision to make in the aftermath of, of 9-11? If I would have been able to make that decision, we, we took, Obama, uh, it was President Obama who, who took him out. But it's not that he just, um, you know, uh, eliminated him. Is that what should have happened afterwards? If I had my uh, say here, which I did not certainly under Obama, um, what I would have done is uh, very simply taken his body. Uh, I, what I would have done is, first of all, wrap it in pork fat, then in pork skin, and then I would have dropped it in the ocean. Why? I don't, it's not a question of Muslim sensitivities. You can't go to paradise which he would have been considered a martyr if you are wrapped in pork, if you are rubbed in pork fat. That's the smartest thing to have done. It would have been a message to other Muslims that this is what is going to happen to you if you dare hurt Americans or American interests. Unfortunately, I don't like what I'm saying. I am a Westerner, I'm an American. But if you're not going to play by their rules in this case, then you will pay. And that's what happened. Uh, and what are your thoughts on all those empires that have tried to conquer uh, and take hold of Afghanistan have all ended in failure, particularly the British, who suffered the worst catastrophic defeat in 1842, uh, that was comparable to that of the loss of Singapore during the Second World War as a lesson that military empires should be very wary of engaging in a military conflict with Afghanistan. Simon, that is the most important question here that you just asked. Watch this. How did the Soviet Union end? Basically, they went into Afghanistan and that was their and why? Because their soldiers, what, what, what happened to the Soviet soldiers there was absolutely terrible. And the Soviets ended up fleeing there. Now, in the 19th century, both the British and the Russians had to deal with this problem. The British were ruling um, uh, India, and the Russians were moving into Central Asia, and both were moving towards Afghanistan. Now, anybody who went in there, the British understood, and the Russians understood. 
uh, it, it was a cesspool. You couldn't control it. So what they did was both Britain and the Russians uh, agreed to create a buffer zone, which is what is Afghanistan today, where uh, you don't go in because it, it'll just destroy you. As you so rightly pointed out in 1842, what happened to the British, the Russians, the same thing. The Russians understood this. The Soviets ignored their own history at their peril, which is why they went into Afghanistan and they paid the price of the end of the Soviet Union. They lost their confidence, the amount of what, what happened to the whole generation of young Soviet males, the soldiers, was unbelievable. They became druggies, they died, they suffered diseases. You don't do this. That is why Afghanistan was created. And it is important to learn from history in that if, if they were listening, if, the, if our side was listening in um, uh, after 9-11, we would have gone in. We, could, we were able to identify a lot of the, um, let's call them radical, fanatical, um, uh, Muslims, because it was all Muslims, um, we should have eliminated, and that is the right word, eliminated them and get out. I, I'm not a military guy, but I would say that we could have done unbelievable things from the air, from what little I know. I may be wrong. Again, it's not my forte. Islam is my forte, Islamic culture. All I'm arguing for is in, in Afghanistan, in Lebanon, whatever, to use their culture to understand, to, uh, to get what we want done. And if you do this, you don't go into their countries. This is why Donald Trump, when he refused, the Iranians were doing all sorts of things. So what you do is you take them out, but from a distance, you don't take territory. If you do, you lose. And I would have to have to ask you um, the actual date that President uh, Biden actually wants to pull out every uh, U.S. soldier from Afghanistan will like literally be the day on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. What message does that send to the enemies of the West, particularly those? Again, a superb Islamic question. What it shows is that we don't have the guts to take care of the problem. Now, I can only say that, for example, when the Israelis would go into Gaza or do this, that, and the other thing, the, the Muslims was, oh my God, the Jews have gone crazy. And they were scared. And they, that is not the Jews, that is the Muslims were scared. They didn't know what to do. And that is the impression you need to leave on the Muslims because that would, that means that they won't come, they won't see weakness, and when Muslims see strength, they fold, and they bide their time. There will be, peace agreements are irrelevant, signed papers don't matter in the Middle East, but they will lick their wounds until they perceive your weakness. Now, your question here about 20 years to the day, America is, excuse the analogy, I won't go into details. America is bending over and say, we lost and we are letting you win and do to us what you'd like. That will strengthen the forces of evil within Islam, the radical, fanatical Muslims, and make them want to, to advance their cause and find other ways throughout the non-Muslim world, in Europe, in the United States, maybe even against Israel. And uh, I don't, it's, it's a declaration of, of submission to them that, and we lost, you won, you make the rules. In the Middle East, that's when you negotiate. You negotiate after you win. Now the Taliban, now the fanatics are gonna make the rules. How deadly for us, but then again, I'm not particularly sure who's running the United States right now. I don't really, from the people that I do know who have senior positions, let's say I find them extremely unimpressive. And I'm not sure that some of them, 
love the values of the founding fathers of the United States, which are the values of Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. Absolutely. Uh, and finally, Harold, uh, I suppose the big question is, with the withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan will only lead the Taliban to take over and we probably will see horrendous acts of retribution with those who supported uh, the United States and coalition forces in Afghanistan. Um, what can we do to, to protect those that have been loyal uh, to the United States and coalition forces knowing the huge sacrifice in blood of British and American armed forces in Afghanistan? You don't withdraw until you make sure that those people who work with you are safe. That means you bring them, in this case, to the United States, to the UK, or wherever. But you must get them out. And you must get them the, give them the opportunity to, to create new lives. They threw their fate and destiny in with us. We asked them to, they did. Now, if we abandon them, it's just one more proof that we are a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 an, an, an enemy that is not serious. I'm loose, I'm sorry, I don't have the right words here. Um, a, a, a harmless enemy and an unreliable ally. That's what the American withdrawal, the way we are withdrawing, I'm not arguing we should be there. It's the way we're doing it. Shame on us. That's a good way to, to leave the interview. Uh, Harold Rowe, thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Headlines and thank you for your expert uh, view on what is only we can describe as very troubling developments in Afghanistan and for America and the West. Oh, it's a stirring and thought-provoking interview there. Uh, President Biden did not order the U.S. forces there in 2001, but he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time, and uh, he, he strongly supported uh, the invasion of Afghanistan. He later said, history will judge us harshly if we allow the hope of liberated Afghanistan to evaporate because we failed to stay the course. And yet, I think if we look back at um, history, we can see that perhaps history will judge the United States in an even harsher way uh, for continuing this for so long with so much um, cost, particularly to uh, Afghan civilians. We already said in the war zone as a whole, which includes parts of Pakistan, over 71,000 civilians have actually um, died in this. Um, we, we have to look at it and say well, what's been accomplished and uh, the way we're withdrawing, as was just said in the interview, is going to cost even more lives. Uh, and the great danger as well, if the uh, Taliban, for example, take over mm. uh, the entire uh, region of Afghanistan, there's a great danger that they will then destabilize Pakistan. And, and Pakistan is a nuclear state. Yep. So you're talking about the possibility of nuclear weapons, the world's most dangerous weapons in the hands of some of the most of the world's most fanatical terrorists. Now that is a prospect that should send shivers down anyone. And I think also that, uh, that, that, that uh, President Biden and the Democrats have completely dismantled the last four years of President Trump's foreign policy. Uh, whatever anyone said about him, whether anyone likes him or not, the reality is that he kept peace and stability in the world because he was an unpredictable leader. They weren't sure what he's going to do. But he had the courage to take out, for example, uh, Qasemi, the, uh, the leader of the Iranian Revolution Guards in assassination attempt. Mm. No, even him didn't think himself that he would actually be assassinated. Uh, and, it, and that sent shivers down the Iranian regime and um, throughout the Middle East and created that stability. So really what we need to see really is uh, a return to to uh, the policies that actually defends the values of the West. And of course, what we have now with Biden, what we have with, with Boris Johnson, including our own useless defense secretary, um, is this, there's no moral clarity anymore. Benjamin Netanyahu is gone from Israel. There is no one with any moral clarity speaking truth. And where does that truth come from? That truth comes from kind of biblical values um, and our Judeo-Christian heritage. That is what gives the West its strength. 
And when we're living in a, such a post-Judeo-Christian uh, world as we are, uh, then we are weak because we don't have any morals. We don't know what's good and we don't know what's evil. We don't care anymore. Uh, and the plight of the Afghan people to be ruled under the Taliban, uh, particularly women and children, would just be absolutely horrific. Uh, and we could just see horrendous massacres take place, uh, uh, as well as an, uh, an insurgency in Islamic terrorism around the world. Well, this is a fear America's partners are fearful of an intensified threat from global jihadists. Al-Qaeda, along with Islamic State, Khorasan, with which it sometimes collaborates, would regain their preferred base for attacks against the West. Uh, as before, Western citizens would flock to Afghanistan um, for terror training. Um, jihadis everywhere would be encouraged and empowered by this perception that the U.S. has lost, they've been defeated by the Taliban, um, and you know th th this is already being trumpeted by al-Qaeda within days of Biden's announcement. Um, they're, they're already signaling victory. And, and honestly, Simon, I think they have won. I think they have won. Um, and I, I think um, the way things have been dealt with, um, this isn't over, and we are going to be reaping great costs in the future. And the great danger is now that the Taliban then becomes a safe haven as well for terrorists around the world and it could become an operational base again to attack the West um, because these Islamist terrorists love to base their operations in failed states. So there's no way that, uh, for example, Biden has any muscle or, or any kind of desire to rid the world of this evil um, because that's what it is. Uh, we're, we're dealing with horrendous human rights abuses. We're de dealing with an ideology that effectively wants to control the world and submit the world to Sharia law um, and extreme Islamic theology and teachings. I mean, I mean they have a global goal and, this, uh, and the Islamic State mentioned this with the caliphate that they wanted to establish in Iraq and in Syria. Um, so the great danger is now that, that, that President Trump defeated ISIS uh, when he came to power, that we could see something even worse emerge in Afghanistan because they'll have the complete backing of the Taliban and also the support possibly of the Chinese who are looking to invest billions of, of uh, pounds of infrastructure money into yeah. Afghanistan. And, we, and we, we've not talked um, t too much about that side of things this evening, but uh, with the U.S. withdrawing, that does open the gates for others um, who have long-standing interest, for one reason or another, in Afghanistan. But pr particularly that reason that you gave a little uh, earlier in the program, that it's so strategic in its location in the world. Um, Russia is already considering its game plan for what happens after September the 11th. China is already showing interest in getting involved and um, looking at how they can gain some interest there. So um, this is one to watch. This is um, a place to watch. Any final thoughts, Simon, there? Yeah, my final thoughts is we really need to pray for, for the Christians. We need to pray for those uh, uh, Afghan interpreters, those who've worked with British and American troops um, because they're in real danger with the emergence of the Taliban possibly taking over the entire Afghan country after the US withdrawal. Yeah, it's um, been a pleasure as always talking through this scenario with you, Simon, and um, I'm sure that it's not going to be the last time that we discuss Afghanistan and what's going on there. Viewers, um, as Simon has reminded us, please keep in prayer, particularly those uh, who are our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan and uh, pray for their safety, pray that there would be justice um, for those who have supported troops at this time. This is uh, Behind the Headlines. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless and we pray that God would give you much peace as you serve him.